All right. Last session of the year. As people uh, wait till people gather just out of habit, even though technically I could just, com you know, commence really, right? This will be the, hopefully the last, last session for a while that I don't do with a lot of school in Mecca. I'll have everything prepared. Some positive and negative developments, but, you know, right now at the end of the year, I did celebrate something positive. So, right, my daughter's about to go to send her off to cooking school. So I'm excited for that. So that's the positive. The negative, I'll, I'll leave out the, out the conversation. But um, all of that and the work I've been doing, though, makes December very difficult, made December very difficult. But I still achieved the goals. <clears throat> and hopefully we can make that a theme. For this class. Okay. All right, let me know if you're out there, if you're ready to build. Anybody that has any questions, I'd like to start it off with questions. I have some really good questions that'll be a core of tonight's class, okay? And I'll get into them. Um, the better the questions you email me, the more it directs the class into what you want it to be as well, okay? So that's a, a very important thing. I want you as students to learn to be scientists. So one of the major, one of the major, honestly, the major beginning point of the scientist is to be able to make questions, to develop them. You know, um, there's a, <clears throat> there's a thing I say all the time to new students that come into my classroom, you know, they might, they might not be serious. I just want to um, check it out for a little bit. You know what I mean? Um, they might just want to check it out for a little bit, and they're not really sure about what is what is there. More importantly, I don't know what they want. It, what they want. So what I do is I always try to give people um, an idea of what to expect that what they walked into the building so that they get what they expect. So if they decide to say, this isn't it, um, they can make that decision, you know? Just give me a moment here. I wanna, um, okay. Yes, this is better, okay. All right, so. Give me a moment here. I'm just checking something I did. Okay. Interesting. Okay. All right. Yeah, so what I was saying that when I get students into the classroom, there's always three things that I tell them, right? Um, so they get the idea of, of, of the class. I'm, I'm, just, I'm having trouble with settings here, okay? All right. 
So the first thing I always tell them is, is that this is a rare time that they might have, that they might not have ever experienced to be able to choose who it is that teaches them, okay? So, and it's a, it's a very, it's a very in-depth concept. It has many facets, but really what immediately triggers in the memory of that first thing. And the reason I give these three things is that if they never come to my class again, they remember that these are things that they could do in life. That as they're trying to learn from all the things around them forever, their entire lives, that they could be more cognizant, more aware of it. Because knowledge itself begins with what? Awareness of just things. Themselves, people, their surroundings. And so it's very arbitrary. All things, right? Knowledge of the cipher, right? And so the first thing is to be able to... Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember how I word it, though. It's funny because I'm not in the actual classroom, so it's not coming to me as quick, the actual wording um, that I use. But um, I'm trying to figure that wording out because the first one, it has a lot of facets to it. So I want to I want to write them in the chat so that way they, they you can get the detail uh, of the facets, you know. Um, but the major premise of the first one, now, and then I'll put little facets like the, the and I'll put them in letters or whatever. Or, or just as points as, you know, in there. But the major facet is to, um, is to verify who is teaching them, right? That's the first thing I tell students when they come into my classroom, these three things, these three major things. And um, the first one, you could see how it has many deaths because it doesn't just expand to who but also what, right, and how, right? So what I mean by what is the things that are around you, um, what type of things you let educate you, right? Um, meaning that when you learn things that are new, how do you process them to where they may, where they go from belief of something you just heard to verifiable where you'll start to experiment with it and then even to the level where you actually will do it, you know, where you actually will, will use the information, right? Where you wisdom it, right? And then also how the differences of uh, direct learning uh, um, interaction uh, from individuals, right? Uh, individuals online, that's a different type of personal interaction, um, the books you read, of course, right? The television you watch, the arts, right? So this is what I mean for a person to finally take this time since they walked to walked inside of a law school in Mecca on their own to take that time that there will very rarely be a moment where they could decide what it is, the conditions by which they learn. Meaning they can, they don't have to learn here. They can actually verify it, you know, and most of us don't, we're learning for survival. We learn to, we have to learn what is taught in a job to, to continue the job. We have to learn um, what they teach us in school so we could pass the test and we could continue the grade. So even though we say, listen, I'm, I'm doing this and I want to learn this because I, but you want to learn this so that way you could get this. And when people walk to a lot of school in Mecca, they think that I want to learn this knowledge so that way I could get this knowledge and be God. You know what I'm saying? That that so then you would say, well, Sunyas, it's the same thing. There, there, there's an end goal, and there might not be a care about the verification of who's teaching them, uh, or how it's being taught, what is being taught, as long as they get the verifiable end clip. That's that's very well and true. But the only difference is, is that unfortunately for them, and fortunate for I think the world, that particular person that thinks that way when they get the knowledge of self or they're trying to get the knowledge of self is that they walked into my classroom. They, they walked into my classroom. So that's over with. I won't accept that. There are people 
And as a side note, I say this a lot so that way you could start to understand the differences that there are motivations to all things, you know? So being motivated toward a certain thing doesn't necessarily mean devilishment, you know? It just means that we're stuck in this world of survival. And a lot of people, when you find learners, when you find learners, are you, uh, especially... You know, especially I'm typing this as I go along, so that way it's, you can see it in there and you can copy it into your notes. Learners, especially um, those seeking a spiritual truth about themselves and their connection to the to the to the world and you know, universe, you know, what have you, right? Throughout time and space, right? Throughout, I'm, I'm putting everything in the bag here. Throughout time and space, right? <clears throat> you know what? It, it's an I get a pop up right when I'm I'm, I'm right now I'm in the middle of writing this right, and the pop up comes right on when I'm right to cover the chat. All right, throughout time and space, that's where I was. That can no thanks to the pop up connection to the world and universe throughout time and space, right? Especially those. Learners, especially those seeking a spiritual truth about themselves and their connection to the world and universe throughout time and space, um, are often either one of two things, right? Either one of two things. And, of course, I'll say generally. They're just curious, right? Curious seekers of new ideas. Okay, and these sound like the best type of learners, but they could go both ways, right? They could go both ways because a curious seeker might might have terrible application of things, and then that's what this kind of society builds, right? We have so much information at our fingertips. People want to know about everything. They're very curious, but they don't really want to learn about everything. You know, so now that that learner is a little bit demeaned, it's a little bit lesser, okay, right? Um, and also, also, I'll answer your question in a little bit. Let me just get through this whole three things uh, build. Um, and and that's great, Quatis. Good, great to have you here. So, the other type of learner, and of course, I'm generalizing the other type. Of learner, and this is my experience of what I've encountered. This isn't really something I study uh, via reading books and stuff. This is what I've encountered at the law school in Mecca in my 20 plus years. Right, the other type of learner is someone that is seeking that is seeking salvation. They've often gone through everything. They they may have gone through Israelite. They may have gone through you know they've gone through gangs, hell, a uh, uh, jail, all of that. They've done things they know are wrong, and they even encountered what is the right ways and means. So when we say in a degree, um, seizing civilization, righteousness, plus knowledge of self, and the science of everything in life, right? We'll just deal with first. They may be civilized. They may, Excuse me. They may be aware of civilization, meaning that they know that this isn't it. This isn't the peak. They may be aware of righteous ways and means, but they can't really activate it. Okay, so knowing about the righteous ways, don't eat pork, um, uh, learn knowledge before you was, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? They may not be able to apply those morals consistently. And so they seek salvation in some kind of way. And they may have been to other schools of thought, right? Churches, synagogues, temples, mosques. And they, and they come to a law school in Mecca as the last. We're, we're not the prettiest looking building. So we become the last the, the last resort. Okay? Right? So when I tell a person to verify who it is that is teaching them, they may not come back. Either of these type of peoples may not come back. And I want them to get, I want to give them the lesson that the first thing you should take remember if you ever left this classroom and never came again 
is everywhere you go, you will be doing the knowledge to something. You'll be studying something. Your mind, your mind will be discerning things. It will be saying, remember this, forget that. Act on this now. Do your best to try to remember it for later, right? We may do this subconsciously, but we all consciously, but we also do it subconsciously. And that's why the training of the mind to learn and to be able to discern quickly, right, is a major study. That's why I think, and as a side note, I think that reading intensely and not worrying, sometimes you worry like when you read books, especially in that, you know, you try to remember every single fact as you go along. I think that's an incorrect way. I think what you should be doing is as you go along, you make notes, you highlight notes, okay? You highlight parts and you say, okay, this is stuff I want to remember, but I'm going to keep going. The reason you keep reading is not because you memorized everything like you can use it right now. Or you'd, you'd read books at a much slower, slower clip, almost useless. And then the more slower you would stop in this fashion to, to come to complete understandings of every useful bit, your reading speed would always you know, would always delay all the time. So what you what you want to do is when you're reading is you want to continue to have in you want to continue to have understanding. In other words, do I do I get the premise? Even if I don't understand it completely as far as use, do I get the premise or how it's used where I can continue? There you can continue, okay? Because things are always better reread as opposed to, you know, in one continuity. You know what I mean? Right? Okay. So anyway, that's a side note there. All right. And again, you know, for those that don't know, I, I, I often, I build in a lot of tangents, you know. Um, I've been lucky. Not really, though. But I've been prepared enough where these tangents can, I can always go back to the, 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 uh, the original point of the tangent. So in this case, it was the first thing. The first thing I tell students to remember if they remember nothing else in their first time in my classroom, right? And that thing is to verify who it is that's teaching them. And you would take this and it becomes a sub lesson of um, <clears throat> learning how to learn, okay? Something that the Sufis taught a lot about. Right? Many of the Sufis, right? the Sufic orders, right? They often talked about learning how to learn. We talk about the pedagogy of things, teaching, but there's also part of pedagogy, right? The science of teaching is also on the other side with the student learning how to learn. And part of the teacher's work is to actually help the student learn how to learn. And a lot of that work of the student is something that can't be done by the teacher. It has to be done by the student, okay? They have to be aware of the disciplines by which they learn. The subjects that they learn best, the type of books that they like to read best, the knowing the difference between books that are necessary to learn from and books aren't as necessary to learn from. This is important because, you know, you may read books, it usually goes this way, that the books, the literature, the studies that are more that are more useful for you are usually harder to focus on, you know? That's just the way it is, you know? And then the stuff that we become masters in and we start to really enjoy are also the things that um, we may imbalance, you know? You may be... Um, studying too much of a subject and not having a balance of things. So this is important as well. Right? Again, these are things I've said for over 20 years, 20 years, you know, and I don't know if everyone that's ever come into my classroom, because if I have taught hundreds, then I certainly have seen over, a th you know, thousands come to the school at least over a thousand people, you know, who knows, who knows, right? So I know that I won't see everyone, 
again. I don't know if what if I ever see him again, if it's because what I said was not useful. Right? So I try to leave them with these three things that they can remember because it would go for any man or woman's life. Right? The second thing, right? And you'll see that it's very paired, but it's the active, active, you know, it's the wisdom aspect, right? That I always tell anyone that walks into my classroom, if you don't remember anything out of this first time you were here, and all you should be concentrating on is like absorbing and seeing if it's true on your own, and you make your decision, but remember these things. The second thing I always say is, um, be a student. Be a student always. And always. By always. And be a student always. By always developing your next question. Okay. Be. I truly think that the student is worthless if they don't know how to develop questions out of what they don't know. And then you would say, Sunyas, how do you know what you don't know? You see? By constantly engaging in research is to find things that you do know. And in that, you step into things that you don't know. And as you step into things you don't know, it helps you develop what else needs to be known. Right? So the student is someone that it's an exercise in humility. The teacher is always a student. You may see me teaching here. I'm asked to teach a lot. It seems like I spend a lot of or all of my time teaching, and it's a large chunk. But most of the time, though, I'm an ignorant student learning things. When people see clips of things I've done, if they see uh, my work, they see my martial arts, these are just products of the classroom. If they see shows that I do, an interview, these are products of the classroom of the previous interview. And every single performance is preparation for the next. See, every performance is preparation for the next performance. And every preparation is the real performance. And ultimately, there is no difference. this happens, then you're truly learning. And as a student, the student is always one willing to be wrong about anything at any moment, right? That's what the student is. It's someone willing to be wrong about anything at any given moment. With the right proofs, with the right information. And that student, it, that definition of the student is synonymous with the scientist, okay? Meaning, when I mean synonymous to the scientist, that the scientist's glory is not in the answers that they present. It's in the questions. It's in the questions that they develop, okay? So that's important to know, you know? Every single class here, knowledge Allah, once it is done, has been a preparation for the next time that I teach. Every single one. You see? And so I can do it differently every single time because of that. 
You see? Every single thing I've ever published is basically a preparation for the next thing I published, right? Because it has prepared me for what will go on out there. Just like a player's regular season is really the preparation for the playoffs, right? This is what I mean. And when I say the preparation is synonymous, it, it is becomes the performance and there is no distinction. When I train in the martial arts, when I train in the martial arts, the training is the performance, right? I do it with as much intensity as a real live situation, right? This is what I mean that when you 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 bridge, you know the the distinction between the two, right? So the student is always asking questions. They don't know everything that they don't know. So they cannot put everything they don't know into a question. That's not really possible. It, what they can do, right? Because that would go against the concept of the unknown either also. That, because if the unknown is finite, meaning we could all number it, then that means that the, that the known would be finite. So the unknown has to be finite as well, right? <clears throat> All right. On to the last one, right? The third thing I tell students when I first meet them in my classroom, that if they forget anything to remember these three things is bathe yourself. Bathe yourself of belief. When you get knowledge of self, there is an assumption that you don't deal with belief. But the truth is belief just means that there are things that are acted upon without complete knowledge. So it is not such a gross statement, right? Just like, you know, we are in a continuum. But because of that, that continuum of son of man, son of man, son becomes a man, man becomes... Man has the son, son becomes the man, man has the son, son becomes the man. Our individual lives are pinpoints in there. So they have an infinite and a finite reality. But because of that finite reality, we're also building in things that we may not all know. Right? And that's the universe being wisdom knowledge. So in that respect, understand that bathing of yourself of belief is the same as bathing. You will get dirty. There will be things that you will be doing that are not based um, on, on, on complete truth, right? Things that you do, like health. No matter how healthy you are, there are always adjustments. There's always learning. There's always growth in that, okay? Right? There's always study in that. There's always elevation, just like with any field, okay? And so when I say bathe yourself with belief, what I really mean is to take, look at your life and start to see the things that are actually, um, <clears throat> start to see the things that you are doing that must be done, that are done with the most, uh, excuse me, with the least amount of knowledge. Where you're not really sure, you know what I mean? And see, this is a difficult thing. That's why I say it last, because to do this means that it usually forces you into the thing that you least want to engage in learning, something that may not interest you. And often the things that don't interest you end up impacting you because you let it build and you're not studying it. So you're doing more and more of it based on belief. You see? And that's all of us. That is all of us. We do that. Okay. And so it's not a thing where you can you can take away this reality. It's more you can embrace it, right?
And I hope um, that that makes sense, you know? Let me see who's in here. Shaquem, peace. Muchi, peace. <laughs> Wise you, peace. 793rd, Divine Truth, Allah, peace. Malik, peace. Right. Also, I saw your question. I'll get to it. Right. What are your thoughts on the common saying, knowledge is power? Um, my thoughts are that it's a very common saying. You know, um, I, I don't, I don't, it's true, but so what? Knowledge is culture, knowledge is wisdom, knowledge is understanding, knowledge, you know, like it's very generic. It, it's a uh, reaps of generic, but in the Western world, that's really the ultimate goal. You know what I mean? And the pain of everything that happens in this Western society to us is often leads to that saying, knowledge is power, because we're often powerless, you see? And one of the ways to appeal to people is to tell them that knowledge is power. Um, but knowledge isn't just power. It has to be empowered by what? It, you know, a scrutinizing use the revelation of per if it's purpose, meaning understanding, and it has to be actually lived out, which is a very difficult thing to do as your culture. And then, then that power is revealed. So if knowledge is power, it isn't that until it's in empowered. And what I mean by empowered is what I said, it has to go through two, three, four, right? So it's a generic saying, you know, it works in the Western world, right? Because everything... Nobody cares about anything unless you can equate it to power, right? So, so we, so we do. You know, it's it's not necessarily wrong. It's just it's more of a shrug statement. You know, it's, it doesn't say anything particular about knowledge that we could disagree with, but it's also not definitive enough to we could say it just is power, right? We don't say that either, right? Okay, what else? Okay, Quatis, I saw you before, yeah. Pro Pittman, peace. Uh, okay. Muchi, you were, what are your thoughts on the common saying now? It's probably you posed the question back to him, right? But you put some math there one equals five, five equals 10. Huh. I won't comment on that. Maybe you could elaborate on that. Knowledge a lot. You said, I think knowledge has a potential for power. Yeah, th this is true. Wisdom is power because it's knowledge of motion, the actual use of it. Knowledge and use is just dormant. Certainly, certainly, certainly. So if I build peace, I'll get to your questions as part of this uh, last session of the year. <clears throat> knowledge a lot. You ask when you bathe yourself of belief, how are you? defining belief? Is it just a lack of knowledge and understanding? Well, that's when you have to really define what you're doing. So you have to have a great awareness of what you do. And a lot of times it's just as simple as saying, what are the things I do the most that I have the least amount of knowledge in? You know? And some of these subjects never end. You know what I mean? What is impacting you the most? You know? Right? For many of us, it's diet immediately. For many of us, it might be uh, economics, right? I mean, that's something I'm always at, at the least of my abilities with and always having to learn, you know, because there, there's so much adjusting with that, right? Okay, Muchi, you have um, you have scrambled your way out of into laughter. I see with the numbers. Okay, let's 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 try to remember that mathematics is something to give insight, not just something to. The more you play with it, the more it becomes a toy. You know, 
Okay. The more it becomes a toy, the more it becomes fictionalized. Okay. The more it becomes fictionalized, the less it has to do with truth. But certainly, it'll still have the traits of wanting to be true. So it's very dangerous. It becomes new morality. All right, peace, Rome, infinite seven. That's peace. I, I, I <clears throat> Prince Ail, okay, that's peace. So in this last session, I'll be going through self I builds questions that they email me some really good questions. I haven't read them all yet. I kind of will just go off the cuff and answer them like I do in the classroom because I got them today and I didn't get a chance to really read them. Um, I will be going through the plus lesson of interactive planning. I look through it and, you know, not to, you know, not to toast myself, but, um, I couldn't think of anything to add that would make yet make it become a part two. So I'm still the overall volume one you'll see is the overall framework. So volume two will have to focus on, on each part, you know? And um, so I think in this 2022, I'm going to look a little bit more deeply into it and go through it as I actually use it, you know? So I'll be using it more consciously, and you'll you'll see what I mean when I when I go through that interactive planning uh, build. Yeah, and um, this email, this uh, plus lesson I'm able to email. Yeah, this plus lesson I, I wrote back in 2013. So um, I think in last year I, I, I went through it, you know, because, again, it's important to begin our year, but I, I'll be going through it again. So, you know, right. Let's see what we have here. Um, 
Malik, you asked what made Elijah say the name Pilon and Patmos were the same, were the same instead of just saying Patmos. You know, that's very interesting because when you do basic research on Pilon, it's like a surname, a family surname, and it has their origins in different European countries, you know? So um, uh, there's more to it, I, you know, but I haven't found much on that. It's a good question, you know? So I don't know exactly why he uses it as a synonym, but it's major, you know? And um, it's one of those things, like, there's so much that comes true out of 120 that that is something that he's just, I'm sure I had a, or have a plus lesson on that, but I, I have yet to find it. I, I know I had something about Pilon, but it, it, it's, you know, and I have a lot of plus lessons up in the attic in my home, in the home here, but I'm having such a tough time finding them. I, I really am, you know? Quartiz, you said you had written down, and that was your question, how you implement it implanted throughout the year. Is it per month thing, or or do you, how do you break it down? Um, what, wait, the plus lesson? I mean, I'm a little confused. What do you mean? When I go through the interactive planning, you'll see, because everybody has a different plan. It doesn't mean that it goes monthly, right? So... Thing skips so much when I'm scrolling. All right, come Islam, Islam Lee, peace. So you said, Quartis, understanding cipher, all being born to understand the reasoning. Three, behind an idea, taking on a deeper cipher, meaning. Oh. So you use cipher to mean depth of, of that reasoning. And therefore having a clear purpose, giving validity to the idea and the action that follows to born that notion. Very interesting. As if the added ciphers, um, they amplify the lead, the lead, um, the lead degree, in this case, understanding. Interesting. I see it as a comprehension of both the future and how one plans to move into it. In that way, it gives one the ability to see their surroundings differently and to decide if they, those surroundings are helping to write one's history or clearly say what purpose they, those surroundings, family, work, et cetera, represent. That's a very good understanding. That's a very good understanding. In practical sense, you continue. It allows me to make more meaningful decisions or to be more mindful of the residual effects of my decisions. It shows me the inadequacies of what needs to be improved on. So it's almost when understanding is in the cipher, understanding cipher, that add on a cipher is almost a magnifying aspect of that singular understanding that's very interesting very interesting it's almost like that cipher is a platter of magnification all right, <clears throat> all right. and naturally the earth wind and fire behind it <laughs> okay <laughs> the reasons right and Quatis, you continue. So I'm improving and grasping the concept of this degree, right? Understanding Cypher is helping me to make adjustments for the coming year. I found what you said last week super powerful. That's peace. The notion of one's development being greatly affected by what they study. So deciding in advance what you will study will be the measure of one's development. Sounds so elementary and perhaps it is, but I had never thought of it that way and have sort of been all over the place with my studies, but not ever really having any structure to it. You know... My Seagun, Bobby, Bobby Lee Whitaker, is incredible. But he doesn't always express himself in a way that the students understand. A lot of this has to do because he actually survived the, a bullet to the head. Like, it actually was lodged in there. And, you know, like, um, he doesn't always say everything. And the more I studied um, ancient Zen texts, ancient Buddhist literature, for some reason, it allowed me to expand, to understand 
a lot of the phraseology he was using because he would use it in a very, you know, you know, a very colloquial, colloquial sense, you know, very, very, uh, very informal, you know, very, very in conversation. And so very ancient way of speaking he had, he has, but he didn't really, it didn't always make sense with everybody. And the more I read the ancient text, the more I started to understand him, you know? So a lot of times you don't always know, you may not always know what is actually empowering you, you see, until you see, you know, the differences. Also, too, studying a lot of ancient texts also helped me study a lot of ancient pedagogy. So it allowed me to develop the style of teaching that I'm known for, for speaking very calmly. Um, you know, unless there's some idiot saying some dumb stuff here, right? Or in the classroom, right? But I usually aren't yelling. I'm usually not getting nuts. Um, it's usually not like that, right? And, and the reason I, I, I developed that style is because I got to do this. I, I developed this style very early because I was like, I'm not going to last too long. I'm at for 20 years, you know? Right? I wouldn't be here very, very well. Malik, you said in today's degree, what are the two germs? I know the black and brown, so one is dominant and the other is weaker. Yes and no. I think that in the way that we use the terms dominant, don't the word weaker is not good. The word recessive is better because dominant in this case means more likely, whereas recessive just means less likely. Okay. So I don't look at black and brown as one do dominant as more powerful. That's the westernized world. And a lot of people love to use that. Black is most dominant and the genetic says, and the other one's recessive, but recessive doesn't mean it's weaker it, in that sense as it, it's a it's a it's a weaker level it's cheaper you know like let's say you have two children and the recessive gene is let's say um the recessive gene let's say my the i have a child and the i have the the um let me think of something um that is not skin shaped so that way it makes sense it, it's a little bit a little bit different right um Let's say the dominant gene is to have wavy hair, but the child's hair comes out more, you know, a little bit more straight, more, more like an indigenous Native American kind of, right? Or, or even let's say it comes out very, very curly, right? Whereas I have wavy hair and then the mother has more, um, you know, much more curly hair, right? Let's say her hair is the dominant and mine is the recessive. If the child's hair comes out more like mine, it doesn't necessarily it, it doesn't necessarily mean that my hair is weaker. It means that it's recessive. You see, in most traits we go through it, and we're taking the spectrum of like, well, the hair would be original man and devil hair. So like, then we, you know, but that's not what's really happening here. You know what I'm saying? That's not really what's happening here. What's happening that when we say dominant, it's really that it's a more potent gene right? It has more likelihood of passing. Whereas the other one, the recessive, has less of a likelihood. You know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily, I, I, in, my, in my understanding, right? I don't think that it means that the other one is weaker. You see? I don't think that. Because it assumes that something happened in the womb to weaken the child to end up with the recessive. See? But that's what people think. But when you're taught genetics, as far as mathematics, it's actually the concepts of probability and the likelihood. So when you study genetics, the likelihood of the recessive has nothing to do with it being weaker. It has to do that it is lesser. There are less genes of that. See? So technically, we'd say there are more black genes than there are the brown genes and more brown than there are the, the yellow. So what Yakub does is what? He's not... He's destroying the black, not because that is the just like, oh, that's the powerful gene. That's the real black man. And then the brown is like the low budget black man. And then 
the yellow is the bargain basement black man, right? No, that's not what that means. It means that that is the most likely. So what he does, it has the most genes. So what happens is that he's equalizing it by destroying the black. He equalizes it and then tops it over. Now, technically, by destroying the black, the brown becomes the dominant gene artificially. You see? That's what's really happening. This has nothing to do, and that's why I say liken it to the limbs. Your arms, right? You've got your arms. They're strong, but they're nothing compared to the thighs. I'm not going to show you my thigh cuts. I got some good glad because I'm not going to show you my thigh cuts. Pause, right? <laughs> but my thighs are stronger than my arms. But then my arm, my legs reach out into my feet, and my feet can't do this. They can't write. They can't do all of the things that my hands can do. So what happens is that, would you say that one is weaker? Because weaker as far as what? As far as the abilities? Because technically the arms can do a things that, and honestly, take physically take us beyond the animal world. It's the arms, the, the weaker limbs, right? So look at dominant and recessive like that. And then you'll try to, you'll start to understand. And what Yakub does is that, the pool of let's say yellow, let's say black pool, five genes to every three brown to every two yellow. So what he does is he equalizes it, gets rid of these, and now there's what? Well, there's three to two, and then zero. So now what's most likely? They're they're most likely to come out this brown. It's about the amount of genes that are in that pool for that particular trait. You see. And the thing is that what he what you find is that the more he dilutes it, not only does he actually change the actual physical structure, right? So now what happens is that not just the shade, the brown shade, the yellow shade, but also all of the traits that come along with that are coming along with it. it, it it's a whole set of a whole list of different traits. But what's coming by doing that artificially is that it's not being done naturally. So the mind and everything is becoming weakened. And that's what causes the grafting. You're not thinking about it properly. Not you, Malik. I'm saying we. When, when I see students think about it, they're not thinking about it properly. You know, I hope that makes sense. Because the 30th degree, right? 30th degree in the in the in the one to 40 it is one of my most um, to me, one of the most important degrees in the universe. You know what I mean? If if there was only one set of 120 and I didn't want it to be forgotten and it was on fire, I, I prob that would be one of the few degrees I would save because I love the knowledge degree the best in the one to 40. But that's in us though. We'll, we'll figure out how to renew our history. But that concept in the science though of what we are dealing with though and what we could fall victim to is in that 30th degree, you know? And um, <clears throat> it's wonderfully written, wonderfully written. Right. And a lot of times people don't understand that when you, you know, people say like, oh, well, you know, you can't make devil unless you destroy the black. And then everybody that sees himself as a black seed assumes that they just have black seed in them. That That's not true either, though. You, you have all the seeds in you, so you're not really one thing, you see? And the brown and the yellow also have. It's just that they have more of the what? The brown seed, more of the yellow seed. So it's each of the seeds is within us, okay? It's the, right? If we were to break it down... And again, the breakdown itself, and that's why the father said it's black, brown, yellow, because the breakdown itself is artificial. Okay. Really important though. Right. I'm glad I'm glad this was it was recorded. It's very important. Very important and an excellent question. You know what I mean? Let, let me go, let me try to go back to see if there's any add-on to, to what he, you were asking about that. Okay. Right, so when we talk about the two germs, it's just the beginning, but it, it's really three, you know, three into the, the 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 grafted. So it's really one, two, three, and then four. You know what I mean? But they're all seeds, though. So when people say the other white man is not a seed, no, no, he gets planted. He doesn't live unless he gets planted. So 
he still gets planted in some type of soil. You know what I mean? So he still lives, you know what I mean? Which means he has the capabilities of being a, a righteous man, which is really the only reality. The, lo the, the lowest level of life is to live a righteous life as, a far, as far as any thinking individual. To be able to live a righteous life, to be able to discern beyond survival and every single, every single human, black, brown, yellow, white, has that ability. It is when it is denatured. Now, because of their reality, it is what? More likely to be denatured because they're what? They have been, it has been altered. And we see it throughout history. I, I don't care what people say about cancel culture, this and that. I don't believe this, I don't believe that. But look through the history. The history is the, the greatest absolver of all of this. Okay? When we say things like all people have done evil, that also kind of takes away from the reality that we have moments in history where this type of evil was not going on. And it, it really does. If there's anything that they in innovate, it's that special type of cruelty. It is a special type of cruelty of subjugating an entire other aspect of uh, other aspect of humanity. No matter how much you go into ancient times, you could find war and everything. You can find violent acts to individuals of the most horrific kind. But this idea of humanity surviving off another aspect, humanity labeling itself to separation and then surviving off the leeching of another aspect of humanity, matrix, that does not exist unless you think the Egyptian pyramids were made by, by um, slaves, which is ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? Ridiculous. You know? Okay. Right? And I don't have to prove that because there is great proof already and we can start to research all of the great texts that we have from D, Chikanti Dia, and others. The Sertima works and others, right? Okay. And see, Malik, you said, I do see that within the black man encompasses all shades, except, right, right? Just to be clear, all of the original shades encompass all the shades as well, right? It's just there's a, a far less likelihood of that spectrum going in reverse, meaning yellow and brown making black. It is extremely rare, but we do find it in society, but it's extremely rare. I think one of the reasons that it is more rare than ever is because the grafting process has also continued mentally. So the mind is the mind makes the mind the mind makes itself and remakes itself. And if you find black to be abhorrent, you most likely will not continue that. You see? If you have the mental means to overcome. And if you have a gene, you have genes that are higher, like more genetic dominance, right? Of the brown and the yellow over the black. And your mind is anti-black, that's not going to happen. See? Right? So it, it's an interesting concept because, again, now with the genetics and the creation of humanity, I'm putting the mind's reality into it. Okay? Kam Islam, you said, understanding cipher means having a clear comprehension of knowledge and wisdom. I also see it as understanding that all things in life occur in cycles, cause and effect, 360 degrees. That's how I always saw it. One germ being dominant and the other recessive. Okay. Then, oh, I'm going to. I'm sorry. Let me stick with Kama's Lama. Means having a clear comprehension of knowledge and wisdom. I also see it as understanding that all things in life occur in cycles. So like now, when we come to these understandings, though, and we come to the 30th day again and again, I want you to look back on that 30th day. And, and of course, December 30th, you look back on the whole year and say, well, what was this cycle? What were these cycles of cause and effect? You know what I mean? Usually in the classroom, I usually ask people to list all their achievements, the things that they have done, you know, the things that they were successful in and all these things, you know? I want to know. I, I want you to know, 
You know what I'm saying? Right? So, like on my social media, I might share some of my achievements because I'm trying to get people to engage in my work. Right? But there are also personal achievements that lead to that. You know what I'm saying? So out of 365 days, 52 weeks a year, there's at least 52 books completely read. There are at least, at least, because there's more, at least um, a thousand journal pages written. There are at least, um, uh, let's see, you got 52 weeks. There's probably only like, I'll give or take, I'll take, I'll take four weeks. That's a lot. Four weeks, right, that I didn't. So that's like, um, five training sessions, martial arts training sessions a, a week, training sessions of all things, everything, right? Maybe add a few about, so at least 250 out of the 365 days a year, I train hard, right? Completely, right? So that, that this is this is the thing. This is the thing here, right? So you're looking at the things you, you worked on, the things you achieved, but then also look at the product of those. What, like what, what did that enhance? What, what did that do? You know, if you're if you're an athlete, what is do you measure yourself by weight, body fat, the way you look, what you can do, all of these things, you know, your abilities, you know what I mean? What you could do better, your relationships, what you could do better, you know. I even think in my relationships, I, I, I was better, you know, as a as opposed to not being aware of what I could do, right? So even if I didn't improve, at least I became more aware. Right? <laughs> All right. So knowledge a lot. You said that's how I also saw it. One germ being dominant, the other recessive. It also makes me think of the 22, sec, 22nd degree. That's dealing with the two pieces of steel. One has power, the other not. Right, right. And of course, though, in the genetics thing, this could shift because it doesn't, the piece, unlike the, the genes, the piece without the magnetic can actually have the piece with the magnetic. So the recessive gene can be what reveals itself, okay? Because if it never did, you wouldn't know it was recessive. You know, you wouldn't know it was there, you know, unless you had rewound and looked through the... Right, through, through, the, through the legacy, through the life. Um, okay. This thing, man, skips, jumps me all over the place. All right. All right. All right. Somebody, there's somebody with a foreign language name. I have no idea what that means. I will assume that you're saying peace. Uh, Malik, you said, what does Puerto Rico mean? Right. Muchi is correct. It literally means rich port. Puerto Rico was named San Juan, right? After the saint. Right. But what happened was is that they really only used it to gather booty, like the things that they stole and they would get they would they would gather it at the rich port. You know, the things that they collected, the booty of the island. Right. And then just head off from there. So they just ended up just calling it after a while. They just referred to it as rich port. I'm going. Where are you going? Well, they were only going there. So it's just rich port. You know, so if there's any a name of a place that literally reveals how a people being blood sucked, it's the actual name Puerto Rico. Like it literally has its name because that was the, the because it was being blood sucked only. Right. So its name really means rich booty, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, Devil is made from the original people, not the original man. Um, yes and no, it has significance. Um, it has significance because you know, like those seeds, how how is they how are they being born? It has to come out of the woman, right? It's coming out of the woman, you know what I mean? So the original woman is definitely being used for this breeding process. How could you breed without the woman? Right? So that, that's certainly significant. I mean, technically, if they said original man, it'd be kind of weird unless they're all, you know, um, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger. What's that movie where he was pregnant? You know what I mean? Right? Junior. <laughs> Terrible movie. Right? 
Hilarious and terrible. All right. No, Muchi is port. It's port. Yeah. Puerto means port. Right? Yeah. And of course, the original indigenous name is Borinquen. Give me a minute um, so I could take a break, right? Relieve myself uh, of these liquids, and I will be right back. Where are we? Where are we? Um, all right, so Infinite Seven, you said we have two variants today called COVID and Omicron in relation to the two germs. Understanding the cipher today, I guess. I mean, I guess. I mean, you're forgetting the Delta and all that, but um, COVID is far more simpler than all that. You know what I mean? Um, it's honestly what's really happening though. Real quick, um, the more people are being vaccinated, the more that the 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 this particular virus is mutating, but it's mutating into weaker forms. You know, to keep itself alive. Um, as a side note, listen, what's my formula? My best formula? Your vitamins B, C, you got your B, C, B, and green, right? These are the most powerful things, supplements. Your B complex vitamin, right, with all the B vitamins, vitamin C powder, so you can adjust and take it throughout the day. Right, because it's not fat soluble, it's water soluble. So you take it throughout the day, right? Not like the B where you just take it once. And your vitamin D because it's winter, you know what I mean? And you may not be outside enough, you know, and you most likely are not in the winter, right? So you take it because the vitamin D levels being high, you're not gonna have you're not gonna get viruses, you're not gonna get viruses affecting you, you know what I mean? And then of course the chlorophyll powders, 
right? Right? That always help detox other things that may weaken you, right? And and also empower you. Okay? These are my these are my superstars that I that I mess with, you know. And again, we've been through this whole COVID and stuff, right? And you can guess how many times I've been sick, right? Zero, big fat fucking zero, okay. Let's see. So anything, all right. Low thighs. Uh, me, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I've been working out though, right? I've been working out. Um, I've been I've been really training heavy this year to reduce body fat and see how strong I am, you know? So, so I try to lift the heaviest weight I can, but not go too heavy only because it wears on the limbs, you know? It really wears, you know? So I think... The weight that doesn't wear on me, and I and I've been deliberately doing it daily to to till failure. Has been starting out at a bench press weight of uh, seventy five times two, so bench pressing one hundred and fifty pounds, um, quality reps. So I get, I'm telling you guys, you know, I can get twenty quality reps any every single day, benching one hundred and fifty pounds with two dumbbells, seventy five each. You know what I mean? And that doesn't, it, it, it works and it doesn't tear at my limbs. Cause I used to, I used to bench, you know, 200 pounds um, and get about almost 10 reps, you know, 200 pound dumbbells. So look at little me and then I'm benching 200 pound dumbbells, but it really weighed heavy on the limbs and stuff. And I've never been great with my uh, launch form, my launch form. I'm great with form once I'm lifting, but I never was great with launch form. So I've had to adjust. I've, I've always been crappy with that, you know? So the longevity, you know? You do your... But anyway, um, why am I saying that? Yeah, I'm just talking about the thighs, yeah. But um, for the legs, it's a lot of squats, you know? 500 squats, right? Intense, intense, you know what I mean? Then I add jump squats with dumbbells, a lot of other stuff, a lot of other stuff. You know what I mean? But um, it's important. It's it's important. It gives you the vitality. If you're trying to create, then you need to. Training is always one way to spark the creativity. You know what I mean? Because it's all of you that creates. You know, it's all of you. The creation is a representation of all of you. You know, and if you love and respect and and have a powerful body. To go along with this powerful mind, it's just one one benefits the other, you know. So now, July, you said, oh, Kama Islami said recessive means less potential, right? Right, because the amount of genes, though. So, like when you see graphs and everything, though, it'll be that there there just isn't more, you know. So think about it as as less amount, you know what I mean? Right. Let's say it's like red, red, blue, and yellow, right? And you've got 10 red, five, five blue, and three yellow. You know what I'm saying? You know that's the order of reset. It's more likely that the red is going to come. That's the dominant, right? So that's what that means. It doesn't necessarily always mean that if the, the other colors come, that the other colors are weak and, and shitty and, and trash. You know, it's the reason you get that way is because when Yakub was doing, he was, he was, artificially altering the process. And so that brown that comes out is not the natural brown. That yellow that comes is not the natural yellow, okay? And if people think that's what's out there, like a person like me or anybody that's brown or anybody that's yellow, then what you're doing is you're forgetting the fact, though, that the cremator did its job. Remember, the cremator, he cremated all of that. So that means that you, from Pilon, you weren't seeing... Uh, you you would def you would see if he didn't do his job. That means we're talking about the white being led by a whole bunch of like earlier versions of of crappy yellow and crappy brown. I, it's just not a sensical shit. You know what I mean? A lot of the other realities of people's noses and their their features and all these things are because the original man has lived in different places for generations upon generations. You know what I mean? And before travel, before this modern era, in the ancient times, 
These generations were developed in solitude for long periods of time, adjusting to their environment and the diets that they created and their mindsets, all becoming these unique genetic realities, right? This is all important, right? This is all important, right? All right. Can it be interchangeable knowledge of lives? Like with the arms and thighs and that, that's just noticing a difference between the two. But if we take the genes, you do have some which are weaker. Um, I think so. But the reason I use the arms and legs analogy is that they are weaker. The arms are weaker than the legs, but there's a reason that they all exist is what I want you to see. See, a lot of people think there's a reason that the brown and yellow exist. See? There's real reasons to that. So it isn't just because that, you know, to be different, they exist for a reason, just like the arms are weaker than the legs, but they exist for a reason. And those reasons are very profound. Okay. Because for the genetic aspect, as far as like particular things like hair, texture, eye, eyes, nose, and everything, there are specific developments that are recessive, but they are deliberately created and self-created because of that necessity. Right because of that necessity of the reality around them. Right? Dr. Dangenstein, is there really a yellow gene though, or is it just a lighter shade of brown? I mean, we could, like a mixture of two browns and you take the more obsessive of the two brown. That's a good question. You know what I'm saying? That's a good question. We've always said black, brown, yellow. That's what the father taught us. You know what I mean? And he taught us that, that, that trilogy, that knowledge, wisdom, understanding, you know, the black, brown, yellow. Um, I think this, <clears throat> and I, I'll, keep, I'll be honest with you, right? And then think of it like this, right? The reason that you make ask that question is because you don't see the uniqueness of the yellow seed. And that's because a, a yellow seed like me would be more of a brown seed. Like a lot of gods, like the great infinite Al Jamar would, doesn't see me as a yellow seed. He sees me as a brown seed, right? And that's because technically I'm from the black and brown indigenous, right? So I don't I don't have that yellow seed like that. So we're not a you've got to be around the original people of the Orient, you know what I mean? Of Asia to see that depth of that yellow seed, you know? And I, I do think it exists. I think that if I was a scientist saying, does that black, brown, yellow exist? Does that yellow exist? Just by observing the realities of the yellow. I would say that there is enough difference in reality to say that it is one with the original and the same, but also deserves this unique um, designation as well in the development of us as humanity. So, you know, I hope that makes sense. You know, it's very, it is a good question. Now it's a lot, very good question, you know? And again, a lot of that thinking to me of Brown, yellow just being a lighter brown is I, I think that because a person like me that is defined by many as the understanding seed, including myself, I, I'm the one that wrote the misunderstanding of the understanding seed. One of my first major plus lessons I, I published in, in the, fi, the power paper, you know what I mean? And, but technically, historically, my actual roots is not with the yellow. It is not with the Asian. It is with the, you know, it doesn't matter how well I do Kung Fu. It is not, you know, it, it isn't, you know, it's with the uh, the black and the brown. You know what I'm saying? All right, Denny's. All right, salute, salute. Nanjala. So dealing with Puerto Rico, were items stolen from other lands and then brought to the island to trade and do business with? Puerto Rico is very complex, though, but it wasn't, I wouldn't say that it's a trading post. That booty, from what I learned, is really just the extractions from Puerto Rico. However, there's very likely that other things from other places, but that more goes to the island of Cuba than it would Puerto Rico. Okay. So that port where everything united. That's more Cuba, knowledge a lot. Cuba is the place where you would see what you just described there. Uh, Puerto Rico was a place where they were extracting out of Puerto Rico and then bouncing. Okay? That's why the most famous fort uh, uh, the, the, in Mojro, right? The famous fort that everybody gets pictures of, you know? You know? Um, 
that was like a dummy fort. It was like a, a shadow fort. Like you'd see the fort and think an army was there, but it was empty, you know? So um, that that place where the booty that they got from all of these colonies that they had, that like Spain had, that booty was mainly human. And that mainly would be interacting through Cuba. And that's why Cuba is that main place. And that's why the music of Cuba develops so powerfully because it's taking from all the other places, including the other islands of Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic, and then uniting there and then going upward, right? Including the Latin American countries as well. But specifically for what we get, El Son, S-O-N, right? Because the two major musics of the, the uh, that make today's music is really jazz and son. And those roots are coming from Cuba into. In fact, jazz roots are very influenced by the, the, the culture as well. And that's going into New Orleans, you know? So it's very, it's very important. It's very important because even though I had had a pose, there was a question on a previous class, you know, where somebody was, be, you know, somebody was throwing you know, really a, a passive aggressive dart at me saying I wasn't original. How do I claim original people's music? And blah, blah, blah. I, I, I wrote the response. But um, one of the things about New Orleans that is incredible, right? And when we talk about the Creole culture, what do you think the Creole culture is? It's it's not just lighter skinned people that blend in. It's really the mixture of, of all of these indigenous black cultures that are colliding at this port. Cuba into PR of slavery. This is the, the entry points of slavery, you know, into Cuba and then through. So into Cuba and then through, you know, so Cuba and New Orleans, that's where the culture derives that's where the culture has its most strongest points of origins and that's why eventually it makes sense that we see son and we see jazz right because when we talk about puerto rico they have their own genres but the one that really catapulted in the americas becomes salsa because it's 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 the jazz influence of son right son is very structured and you don't, you wouldn't notice it if you hear Buena Vista Social Club. You would notice it blatantly if you hear Buena Vista Social Club, which is more new, but it's you, you get the point. And and an Eddie Palmieri song because he's very jazz, right? Um, you would see the difference of what I mean. You know, the improvisation, the extension of the compositions, um, and all of that, right? Anyway, I digress, you know, it's just the, the add-on there. But um, since you're talking about Puerto Rico, just using that music as a way to show you, you know, the cultural development can show you also the travel of everything, right? Quatis, you said, when it comes to belief, why do you think so many people rely so heavy on belief or allow themselves to be guided by it? Is it that is just easier? Oh my goodness, that's easier than anything else. It's the easiest fucking thing to do. You know what I mean? Right? It's easier that it's easier to do than anything else. That that's it really is, you know what I mean? Is it easier to to research COVID and to find countless and hundreds of studies? Right? Is it easier to just believe what they told you that it is safe for children and just give it to them even though children have 99 over a 99.7 percent chance of survival with it the only children that have ever been shown to die from it are children that 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 have comorbidities or were sick right from due to other causes like cancer and other diseases right and so at at at, at best is it, it is an unnecessary protocol Something that um, medical ethics um, says never to do, right? Right, because the first rule is first do no harm. So why would you give an experimental, you know, biogenetic therapy, synthetic biogenetic therapy to young children's genes that aren't yet developed yet, right? Because it's easier. It's easier to believe that they said so. It's easier because everybody else is doing it. And, you know, you might have to do some research. And what if you do all this research and you're wrong? And while you're doing it, though, you're ostracized while you're researching and don't know for sure. Right? 
The truth is, is that, like last week, I spoke a lot about Lord Jamal, but Lord Jamal is such a case study. I don't dismiss Lord Jamal. You know what I mean? Like, don't don't dismiss him unless you really study him. Though I I study him though with intrigue at, at times. You know, until I get sick. You know, but I study with with intrigue until I get totally revolt and, and I, f I feel a vomit feel. You know, when he keeps on what he's saying. But I study it with intrigue because his suspension of belief is so magnified. He suspends his belief in anything that the oppressor says, but he stays at that point. He does no research. Um, absolutely no research. I'm trying to think. like Zero research. Everything is just based on what he's thinking. You know? Like, logic. And having the mathematics for so long, please don't don't forget the truth that supreme mathematics, if you really understand it well, and Lord Jamal certainly does in many, many respects, it actually could be a very dangerous tool because it allows you to make logic out of things. And that's why I say be wary of the path of numerology. You know what I mean? Right? So he's almost like a ball player that, he jumps really well, but he doesn't want to do anything else. So he won't work on his jump shot. He doesn't work on any of the skills that make him a ball player. You know, he just works with that one raw gift that has been honed. And that's a jumping ability. So what happens? He's jumping all over the place looking like a damn fool, you know, and not getting real results as far as winning basketball, right? A true understanding outcome, a victoriously true outcome of understanding, right? Boy, I worked that metaphor too, right? Shit, I earned me some basketball tonight. I didn't watch basketball tonight. <laughs> right? But um, it, it is much easier. It is much easier. You know what I mean? In my life, I, I've always taken the more hard road and been so willing to prove it that the biggest challenge is to try to justify the hard road. And that is dangerous as well, too. So what happens is that I end up doing even more and more research to try to justify it. And a lot of that is because of you all. Every, almost every single week of my adult life, I have had to come to st in stand in front of a room, a revered room, a revered place. And share things that I have to make sure that I know it's true to the best of my ability. And that type of pressure I have embraced and I have enjoyed it. It has been a great honor. But it allows me to continue and in these days and times that are extremely difficult. Right? I've said this before. I've had great difficulty um, financially this year. Many opportunities I wasn't able to have because of these mandates. You know what I mean? Opportunities that I've been working at my whole life. Because of these mandates, I lost. You know? I wasn't able to do them. Work with certain companies and people because of their mandates, you know? And I, and I have suffered. And, and it's only because I have a great support system that, that I'm able to continue. You know? That's really what it is. Right? But it's because of the life that I've lived of constantly studying to see what goes beyond belief. Mm -hmm. And so even loved ones give me the benefit of the doubt, whether he, oh, because they can't disagree, right? They can only say that they're doing something different, right? Malik, you said what's so powerful or has so much significance to you in the one knowledge degree in the one to 40? Oh, because you're writing your history in advance, and I'm a writer. There's, there's no way that that degree doesn't hit me like a ton of bricks. You know? It, it's, um, it's, 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 it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous degree, right? So the wise man of the East. Black man makes his history a Quran. 
the 25,000 years, right? Equal to his home circumference by adding a year to every mile. Every single step that he takes, I see the miles as the pages, right? And the miles of the pages and the home circumference is everything that you are about to encounter. You see? Every, every, not just what you live, but also what you understand and the creative ideas that you have, you know? And so when your history lasts for 25,000 years, you renew it. And it's a writing degree because it talks about the other written in advanced works, the Quran and Bible. You know what I mean? Oh, I love it. I love it. Powerful. Very powerful. Quartis, you added on, you said, or is it, or is conformity that great provider of safety or security that so many crave and need? I, I think that's true, though. I think that's true, you know? Only a few people can live this life, and that's why, you know, we could also argue that there always would be a 5%. And if we lead this society, we have to have the most humility and the most reverence, but we can never stop trying to empower people. Because I don't think there will never be a peak of, of, of this society, any society. The, the most righteous world that I can envision isn't people leading other people righteously. It is people making their own decisions for themselves and the greater good in, a, in the most humane way together. You know, Everything else is a step toward that. You said also, how does the notion of freedom apply to the concept of a good life in the context of one who is thoroughly guided by belief? You know, I can't say. I can't say, you know. I think it's just free from feelings, the feelings of stress. So some people just want the freedom from the feeling of anguish, right? The feelings of stress. And certainly that can give it to you. Right? Someone guided by belief, though, especially if the society supports that, can certainly do do well, you know? Right? Malik asked me, how's my family doing? Um, there's some bad getting getting through it or dealing with it is a better better term. But um at the end of this year, uh this weekend, um my oldest daughter made it into the Culinary Institute of America. So it's a it's a it's it's a great weekend coming up. So she'll be um moving upstate and um attending you know the culinary institute of America and you know I couldn't be I couldn't be more excited you know it's it's amazing she wrote her history in advance lived it out and, and succeeded and uh, amazing. I'm, I'm so proud. You know? So it's great. And a very, very, um, a very joyous weekend coming up, you know, sending her off. Boy, I don't even know how to respond to that, Moochie. You said you watch Killer Priest podcast, and one of the panelists said that polar bears didn't need a Yakub to be polar bears, no other albino creatures. Yeah, see, this is where science is really bad. I'm a really I'm a fan of the polar bear. You know what I'm saying? It's one of my favorite animals. 
I've taken my children to the zoo to see it when they were at this when polar bears were in the Central Park Zoo. I love polar bears, and polar bears are not white. You know, they have translucent tips on their fur that reflects light, and so they 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 always appear whiter, and so their fur is going to look white at all times. However, the polar bear skin is black. Okay. Yes. Polar bears are not white. Okay. Their fur is white. Their skin is not white. So that is the most weirdest statement ever. Of this. so now there's animal yakubs out there. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I don't know. You know, it's like they didn't watch one documentary. They didn't watch it. Let me tell you something. You learn more from watching the six episodes of Will Smith's Welcome to Earth than you will watching those podcasts. Killer Priest is such an ingenious lyricist, such an engaging talent. I think his records this year, I said it last week, the only way I could catalog it and document it is that his records this year, along with the last two years, take him into a legend status because he's done so much. And then to do it again this way, just the way people are overtly blown away by Nas with magic and how he rhymes so great now the same could be said for killer priest who's been rhyming since 98 this good so yeah you know, he'll be known for like a podcast that shared crazy ideas you know and um i, I hope it benefits him and he can make more records that he enjoys because he's clearly making records that don't give a damn about what sells Mm. And that's what makes it more endearing. You would think that the artist would have some benefit, would have some notoriety where they could live off this after a career and then make records that are different. <clears throat> Knowledge like, can you build on your understanding and the purpose of the use of the term Asiatic? Um... You know, the roots of the nation of Islam are very linked to Japan. They are very linked to during World War II times and trying to recruit a, a, a Japanese African contingent. And I think that's where Asiatic becomes more comfortable in the terms. I think it's something that they saw was the truth and was reflected. And they need a unique term, not Oriental, because that means a thing from Asia. Um, not Asian because they're not just people that are from the Asia that we know today, the continent, but from Asia, meaning the entire reality, the, the, the entire, you know, pan, the, the, high, the Pangea, the entire, right? Cause that's many etymologists say that Asia comes from the root Pangea, which means the entire earth when it was one, when the land masses were all one. So that's where I see the word Asiatic coming from. Someone would, Asiatic means of a like, like, right? When you say stylistic, right? Of a style, right? Of Asia and of a different type of Asia he was using, a more encompassing Asia. And, and that's where that term comes, I think, the purpose, you know? Dr. Dankenstein, you said, I see the uniqueness of all shades, but just going off the lessons, it was black and brown germ. It doesn't mention anything else when it came to that graphic process. That's the reason I say that. I see where you're coming from, though. Right. Now, the lessons is one thing, right? Those are what the Muslims were taught. And that's the Muslim teachings that become our 120 lessons. But I build with understanding. And I'm not from the nation of Islam. And I'm not a disciple of any of the disciples of Elijah Muhammad directly through that Islamic paradigm. You know? I'm a student of the students of Allah the Father, see? And that's what he taught. And he taught it with understanding that made that made logic, that made sense, and actually, um, to me, brought in the reality of the black, brown, and yellow. And the more, you know, a lot of people don't know about the Asian and the broadness of them and the distinctness of them and the originality of them, right? So it, it's it's very important. Because their yellow is much different than the yellow you would see on me. And you would, you know, and I don't mean you, Doctor. I'm saying you rhetorically. You see that the more you study 
of these ancient cultures and how creative they are, how uniquely different and how uniquely wonderful. It's an amazing thing. And definitely a great question. Right, Malik? Definitely. All right. See where we're coming from. That's peace then. Now, as well, you said I was having a discussion the other day with an Israelite brother in the build on Asiatic Kingdom, so just want to get an understanding from other gods. Oh, okay. You know, a trading post, Malik, looked exactly like you would think. It looked like a stage, you know? That's what that means. It's literally a stage. It's a store. Right? It's, it's crazy. It's crazy, but it's that's the trading post is really that simple, you know? And that's why in, in history, trading post literally often means a store also. So remember, also societies in this modern era, though, they're all by the coastlines. So important good comes in. And they go into the um, into the trading post. So trading post also means like a goods store, you know, goods sold, you know. So trading post literally means store. You know? In this case, though, the trading post of you know selling original people. So that post looked more like a stage because they were like, you know, come on up, check it out, what we got, you know what I mean. Right. A preem peace to God, a preem. Right, one year to every mile will give all that you have in your power. That day, hey, that's how that's how it's done. Thank you, seven ninety third. Yes, congrats to my young queen. Yeah, Malik, excellent news in your daughter and being victorious endeavors, and I will all remedies itself in the family. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Rasul isn't even from this nation, from the way he talks, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. I knew I'd get allergic soon. <clears throat> yeah. I, I agree with you, uh, Rome. Naz is very unique, and, and now that he has the money... He can make, he can experiment, he can make records, you know? And the thing is, Nas was always experimental. A lot of the records that people don't like, I really think that Nas was experimenting, trying new things, you know what I mean? I think only in the late 90s, those Nostradamus, those 99 albums, where he was trying to experiment, hoping for commerciality. And I think a lot of his influence that he used, you know, he used negatively, which most great MCs use negatively, was the impact of Tupac, who to me was the most unique GOAT candidate ever. So lacking in, not at the highest peaks, I'm not going to say lacking, not at the highest peaks we expect of any GOAT candidate on a lot of skills and techniques. But there are so many aspects of songwriting, infused soul, right? The the inflection style, 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 uh, style, style um, songwriting skills, Quotables, people be asking like MCs are made by quotables and Tupac has more quotables than almost anybody out there. And this impacted so many people. That's why, you know, more than just now is wearing the uh, leather jumper and looking crazy, you know, the, le the red leather uh, overalls, leather overalls he was wearing. Oh my goodness. What a low point. You know what I mean? But Nas is a legend, you know what I mean? And Every record he makes makes him a a, a a greater goat candidate. You know, it, it's it's inspiring to listen to. Uh, you know, I listen. Not Az second album, New Do or Die Two, uh, was very good. You know, and the more the more you listen to it, I and I don't mean you. Seven ninth, but I think that the more one listens to it, it sounds better and better because he rhymes uh, so perfectly, you know. Nas and AZ rhyme perfectly, they make no mistakes when they rhyme as far as flow and technique. But Nas is Nas is much more subtle, whereas AZ, when he rhymes, is it's so overt that he rhymes perfectly, 
You know what I mean? Because he catches, he makes so much melody in his rhythms, the way he flows. Right. But I, I really enjoyed AZ's uh, Do or Die too. I, I definitely did. You know, there were some missteps, but um, I enjoyed it a lot. I did. I did. You know. Right. Because people like AZ and Nas, they're they're not tapping into the greatest producers of this time. If people think Hip Boy is one of the greatest producers of the year, I mean, you're not really listening to all the music that's out there. They're not. He's not. You know what I mean? And neither are the people that worked on AZ's album. You know? Right? It's just certain. It's. It's just that people like Nas, they, they make songs. So it's who they're comfortable with, not necessarily how great the person is. You know what I mean? Ah, you speak about the whole discography. Yeah. Mm. Um, maybe, maybe. I, I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with that. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. You know, when you say the whole career. Hey, Prem, you said, indeed, your Rasul's with York. Yeah, yeah. Funny thing is some of those pure Sufi 720 and Sar and Nuwabi faction got in contact with Robert Walker to bring back his nation. So far, they haven't been successful. You know, I don't care about any of these people like that. When he want to argue about where the name Allah comes from, this and that, I don't give a goddamn. Because all of these people are making arguments to go away from the real thing that needs to be studied, though, and that the original man is God. Call it what the hell you want. You know what I mean? Call it what the hell you want. But in the end, he's just another guy with the name of Allah in his name, and he deals with a mystery. So call it what you want, you know? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. See, I found this, though. You may We maintain the integrity of our teachings by just creating things that uphold it, that show the reality of it, and then also teaching it right when we can, though. You do less, though, trying to correct everybody with it. You know what I'm saying? And, of course, I say that with bias because if I just teach correctly, anything I say is always, and I'll say, I say this to anyone's face. I don't care how long they've been in a nation. I teach and I show and prove, and I'm at a law school in Mecca. So what I say is more official. You go tune in to Dark Kim, what he says is right and exact. But because he has the, 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 he took the effort, because he has always been at the school, everything he says is more official. I'm a public enemy collector, Malik, so I have all their albums. You know what I mean? And it's one of my favorite groups that I don't listen to as much. But because I cover so much music today, I don't, I don't get the chance to enjoy a lot of music. You know what I mean? Uh, of the past, of course, though, because Public Enemy still makes records. I still have to update, and they still make great records. The rec they came out with two albums, I think, last year, and I, I enjoyed them a lot. You know, and Chuck D. Just to give you a little bit, so you're talking about hip hop. My Mount Rushmore. So there's always people talking about Mount Rushmore. R Rushmore is the people that are foundations for this music, but who propelled it to be what it is. And um, my Mount Rushmore has always been this. I, um, it's twofold. So I like to do it on purpose. I like to do my Jesus cross, right? So you have the spectrum of lyrical content. And this is just some of the things, the major things that they, because these guys that I'm mentioning, they're much more diverse than this but the major Mount Rushmore elevations that make it an actual music because they did it again and again classically, right? So it's not just pioneering, like the first guy to shoot a jumper, right? But the ones that really defined it. So I would say as far as content, you have the spectrum of Cool G Rap um, and Chuck D. But of course, though, overlapping in that, you have Cool G Rap um, with the depth of technique, Right. Then you have the 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 depth of um, songwriting ability. You have it from the concept level and persona. And then you have it not only just from the persona, 
but also from the deepest concept of all, the knowledge of self. And then you also have song structure, everything. So then you have Rakim in uh, KRS One. And of course, though, everything I said, these guys overlap, you know, as far as the impacts. But I think these four, everything, everything, um, what makes this a music that can continue is them four. You know, until then, it was just some great songs, collections, pioneers. But until these four start making classics, albums, songs, innovating techniques that everyone does, you know, and then probably if we had to be honest, probably the highest peak of that all combining into one is, is Wu-Tang as a group. You know what I mean? But anyway, I digress. I can talk about that all day, but I love Public Enemy. You know what I mean? Um, I got to keep it real. I think every major Public Enemy album is worth having. You know? All of them. All of them. You know? All of them. I'll tell you how. And I even have Chuck D's two solo albums. I think he has two solo albums. I have all of that. I'll tell you how big my Chuck D collection is. Real quick, before I continue with what I'm reading. Because I keep it all in my... Uh, So many great, so much great music I have. I don't always have the time to listen to everything. Where is it? Yeah. Yeah, I have 300 Public Enemy songs. So I have everything. Almost everything. You know, I can never say I have everything. Right? You also said for his... Uh, Ability always will better production supplementing such for a in his prime with or without knowledge. Yeah, yeah, I see it. A preset in the so called Muslim gods or gods of six. <laughs> I like that. Gods of six. They don't have the understanding. The black seven on our flag represents understanding. We are lost gods. They are nothing in comparison. You know, sadly, they're manipulative too. You know, and that's what makes them not in comparison. It isn't because they're just sincere people that believe something different. Like they truly believe something different. No, it, it's they. The more you study Muslim gods, they're deliberately picking something different to make a different teaching, which becomes now belief that they say isn't belief. But then now they can only get unique adherence, and um, it's crazy. And yeah, Malik, Bomb Squad production was impeccable. What PE album I listen to the most? I got to tell you that I'm not that type of listener. I don't, I study albums, but over time in collections, I'll listen to albums. But then if I listen to Public Enemy, like right now, I'm not going to listen to albums. I'm going to shuffle the entire playlist of everything, those 303 albums. So I can tell you my favorite album, but I don't, I wouldn't be playing it because I've heard them so much that after that year or those years, I'm not really going back to it like that, you know? <clears throat> but um, let me see. I guess I can count here. Um, it's ridiculous. Public Enemy albums: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. Yeah, about twenty-three albums. So I'm not really a person that selects an album. Very rarely, you know. But I like to shuffle everything. But it takes a nation of millions is is um, my favorite. With Fear of Black Planet rights behind it, because those those are best. And um, I've always loved Apocalypse '91. I thought that was very underrated, you know. And of course, though, the classic Shut Them Down remix, you know. I, will, I love both versions. I love both versions. But anyway, right? who doesn't, right? Who doesn't? You know, but now that I have like over 300 Public Enemy songs, I mean, it's just, for me, it's a joy to just shuffle all that and just explore, you know. But yeah, Fear of a Black Planet, I, I mean, um, Takes a Nation is, the, is my favorite. 
you know, Fear of a Black Planet, because those are the two you got to get, you know, you got to get those, you know, and I didn't always love Chuck D immediately because it wasn't him. It was because I didn't care for Bomb Squad production because it was too sloppy. I like the clean, thick production, you know, like I, I, I and um, I've always loved G-Rap the way he rhymes, you know. I've always loved G-Rap the way he rhymes. I've always been enamored by KRS, what he was saying. And um, Rakim always amazed me the way he wrote his voice. So it's just, you know, right? So that's a good segue, right? Public Enemy at 1018. Wow. That's amazing. I, I've never been to a PE concert, though. That's probably the greatest co hip-hop concert I've never seen is a PE concert. You know, yeah, great album. Yeah. Great album. I'm gonna, st I'm definitely gonna build about that now. You know what I'm saying? And um, there's been so many questions here that I, I, I don't know if I'll get the self I builds questions until next week, but um, I definitely will do the interactive planning build today. So, all right. Burgess McMillan, peace from Milwaukee, Cream City. Peace, peace. Indeed, indeed. Change the game with samples, right? Yeah, bummer's the show. I mean, come on. All right. All right, I have this open. Let's go, you know, we're at the end of the year and I want everybody to plan. Um, this is a plus lesson that I wrote in 2013. Um, in many ways, it's definitive for me. So I didn't, I couldn't think of enough, some things, but I'm collecting things to try to focus on aspects of it to make more volumes. But Again, this is the first one, and it's volume one, the overall framework. You know what I mean? All right. So let me go through this so that way um, we don't miss out on that, you know? Um, yeah, it's a acquired, acquired taste, Bomb Squad. You know what I'm saying? Acquired taste, which I acquired. You know what I mean? All right. When I was in the 90s, I never cared for um, Parliament Funkadelic records either, but I love them now. You know what I mean? um, Ali Vegas, I, th I, I think he's a little overrated in history, but he was dope. Um, Jinx the Juvie is dope. He never really got a chance, you know? Jay Dinner, that's a good question, but it's <clears throat> all right. I think you meant etymology because entomology is the study of is zoology, you know what I mean? Uh, study of insects. So I'm pretty sure that you meant etymology and phonetics. Phonetics just means the, the way the words sound, you know what I'm saying? Um, and that's part of. Um, that's part of etymology because you change when, with many words, when the sound changes, the definition changes like nigger and nigga, you know, and white people trying to get by with that. Right. <laughs> right? But, um, yeah, you know what, Rome, I think Jinx, uh, stack bones. I think they were they were great. They had potential. You know what I mean. Um, but they're not. They weren't. They didn't get to realize their potential. So, you know what I mean, 
I, I leave it at that, you know? Yeah, etymology is the history of the study of words, like how words change. And phonetics has a lot to do with that because words change by how you pronounce them too, right? As I gave the example, it's the most obvious example we could use because it's etymology that is happening before our eyes, right? Right? And yes, the Sufic orders are very much, but remember the Sufi, the Sufis were very much into pedagogy, teaching. And so they used all the tools and sometimes the changing of sounds of tools. A lot of the older gods are the same. They, they um, words that sound like other words could show the connections between things, even if the etymology really wasn't there. You know what I mean, right, right, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know, uh, you know, that that's what it means, how every letter has power. Um, it doesn't mean that every every letter always has power, though, you know what I'm saying? Because words that change, like the way England spells and the way uh, spell, you know, people spell in, in English here, some of these some of these developments are not as dynamic or as mind-blowing as one would think, you know, so they, they don't always have that that epic nature in them. They just change because they're easier to spell. You know, pe people find it easier. And then sometimes words change because people teach them wrong. And then the word changes. You know what I'm saying? Um, so it depends. And not everything is the most epic thing in the world. What also happens is the etymology gets uh, lost. And a lot of the etymology of a lot of words, they tell you the course of how the word changed, but not why. And I think the most important thing in etymology is why and a lot of most etymology dictionaries don't tell you what words meant and how they changed you know right hey prem that's right that's right you know <clears throat> and soon yes too i built my name on the alphabet too all right all right let me do this uh I i'm gonna do this so the interactive planning plus lesson, and if you email me at sunyas97 at gmail.com, I'll send it to you. You know what I mean? So it's entitled Interactive Planning, Actually Writing Our Own History. So there you go, Malik, right? It really goes with my favorite degree in, in 1 to 40. Volume 1, The Overall Framework. And I quoted James Allen from As a Man Thinketh to start. He said, you cannot travel within and stand still without, okay? The premise here is this. And this is when I was making yearly plus lessons and I was designing course material for, for each year to have a theme. And I think this was the last year I did that because I didn't get enough students engaging. That, that's what happens when you teach at the school voluntarily. Not every student is going to do all the assignments though. But I developed it. So I said the premise was the yearly theme of the course this decade has shifted from work, 2010, to understanding, 2011, to our works, 2012. Then, of course, I'm 2013, interactive planning. Building with our supreme mathematics daily is to focus on a principle that is potently applicable in the patterned calendar. Okay? That's what you need to see. You need to see the calendar as a pattern a pattern that you can engage with and catch its flow and be able to repeat and develop and overlap and pile on the excellence of your work. Unlike that, we are turning our attention consistently to a crucial factor in development. This year, that theme is interactive planning. This is, of course, this is from 2013, where with all the prior themes of years past, we'll supplement our actualization of the first degree in the one to 40. The work we put in will be observed and directed by our acknowledged perspective of ever-developing understanding. All culminations in our works that will be the building blocks to intricate planning of the culture of our days. A reality, a way of life that is interactive with whom we love, whom, whom we share with, and even against the enemy obstacles and immediate threats that are posed. Writing our own history, right? I put that in quotes, will not merely be a statement of arrogance, but one of determined sincerity. It is a willful adaptation to goals that we constantly test and scrutinize to be vital for ourselves and all humanity. All humanity. For as God on earth and even the civilized man and woman, this supreme level of responsibility must be natural. It only varies 
according to the endowed birthright of the individual and the power they place into their determined ideas. Right? Just so I can lean back and put my glasses on. Okay. What follows is an overall framework that will become more and more detailed in lesson and assignment as the year progresses, as we progress. Okay. So theoretically, you know, you would jot these down, try to apply them. Okay. And of course, if there are any questions, just throw them in there. I, I, I'm looking at the questions while I read this. All right. Okay, so it starts, basically it's a four-step system, right? And the first step, the first major step is decision, okay? Decision. And it goes like this. Using the bat, build awareness square, the 2010 plus lesson, right, that I wrote about what you were doing the knowledge to, right? And in there I wrote, you're doing the knowledge to specific things so you get a better knowledge of yourself. You, and I even wrote, I even made a separate plus lesson video about the build awareness square, right? So those particular things, let me see if I remember off the head. Um, what you eat, how you train, what you read, meaning whatever you read, absorb, study, how you write, meaning how you express yourself, right? From the writing on everything, right? Because it includes speech, how you speak. And then also the fifth one, how you share. And just taking note of how you share, right? Which would mean who you share with, how you share, all of that, right? Using that that plus lesson, study and knowledge honestly your desires, wants, needs, cross-matching them with intentions, principles, talents, and resources. Most of us don't really have good goals because we don't take what we want and what we desire we need. People always say just... Separate your desires from your wants and stuff like your needs, your wants from your needs. But you also have to cross match them because things that you want, right, may actually be achieved faster than the things that you need at certain points. So it's not just about needs and wants, okay? Sometimes the things that you want can actually make you better able to get what you need. So you have to cross match them with your intentions, your principles, if you're not using supreme mathematics to define your principles, how you will engage certain things, how you will interact, right? How you will see certain things, then this, you're not using supreme mathematics, right? If you're not ever gauging your talents, though, where are you legitimately at with certain things? Where What are you developing? What is becoming strong? What is becoming suitable? Because these are the things you rely on along with your resources, right? You have to cross match that with your wants and needs. So you cross match those things with all of those, okay? Focusing now, again, I wrote here principles. You're always developing understanding and your base understanding, the initial perspective of sincere bias. And this is something I built on in the earlier plus lesson called Understanding Volume 1. A base understanding means a perspective that you look with everything. Remember I said that, that Lord Jamal go, goes nuts when he veers away from the path, right? And it's only based on one base of understanding. There is a suspension of belief in anything that the oppressor tells him. So he's going to just go the opposite, okay? See, that's you have to look at your base understanding because that isn't a suitable base understanding, though. It doesn't have a, enough premise, see? I'll give you another example of a base understanding that could go off base, right? That's one that could go off base because not really understanding. An example of a base understanding that is understanding is the babies are the, gr the greatest, the babies are the best part. So that means that when we, gods and earths, when we look at situations, we tend to look at them with how it will impact children immediately, right? So that becomes what I call a base understanding. It's a lens by which we look at everything first and then we adjust, right? Because not everything is directly for the children. Some things have to be developed for adults, but then we see, well, how could that indirectly help the children? So we always have that base understanding that the children are the best part. And so our lenses are geared toward them, 
right? That's what I mean by base understanding, right? So you're always developing understanding and your base understanding is always getting sharper. These are important because your principles, they aren't a static thing. They don't stay still. They, they don't change violently to something else. What happens is that they become more profound and more able to fulfill, okay? So you have to be able to see that as you develop. Then you also study your works and the works of others as they all impact on this model of assessment. In other words, you're trying to do something and decide what you will do. This is the decision phase. What will be your goal with specific things? Then you have to look at your works and what you have done this past year, for example, right? Because we do it yearly, right? And then what do you want to achieve and how that will work out, right? Okay. So there's a lot of reflection on the way that you have worked. Okay. Right. And then you're also thinking about the com consequences of this decision, the possible consequences, the impact on others, what will be built versus what will be destroyed. And something is always happening with both, right? Repercussions over time, right? How difficult do you expect it to be? right? What could make it more difficult, right? Because you may have one goal, but then another goal that you want and that will develop you great, but then a goal that you need might take more precedence later. So you might have to adjust, right? So you, all of these things are being taken into account. All right. All right. And, um, Nice to get some. Uh... All right. I don't know what that was, but I just straight delete like uh, what looks like uh, like a spam message in there. Tainting. Okay, as I continue, that was the first thing, decision, right? And again, I can't tell you what the decision will be, what you will do, what you will continue to do, what you will begin to do. Sometimes it's just a decision to do something even better. How will you do it better? So the second thing is implementation. The preparation designed this performance. Again, I clued into what this, to this earlier. To work a plan is to engage focused direction as a lifestyle. Ultimately, one blends the worth of preparation and performance, worked plan and fulfilled plan. Then one has founded a crucial principle of the righteous culture. Okay. In other words, Whatever you have succeeded in, you have to take that as a model by which you engage in planning building for the next plan, okay? Everything that you have succeeded in are actually the blueprints that are special to you of how you can achieve the next plan, okay? And also vice versa. The failures are also the clues of what to avoid, right? The second thing here is write an exact prior, meaning... Is this plan correct? Is there a strong basis of proof, historical precedence that it will fulfill the objectives? Okay. A lot of our plans and what we're trying to do have been done before. You know what I mean? They might be planning uh, health, health plans, all of these things. So what is your foundation of research, right? Is it really right and exact? You know? Can it be done? Pre-plans. Working and timing involved. How much time will it take and how much work? Planning to make time and plans to prepare the work itself are often the work and plan that mold individual work. A lot of times we make a plan, but we don't spend the time to evaluate the plan as it's going along. We ignore it and let life go on, you know, and that's how we get rid of the goal often instead of adjusting the plan. So you have to take, you have to gauge the quality of the plan as you go along and pre-planning is part of that. Mastered performance, right? If the plan is to be greater at something, then does one's work directly engage in mock performance or as close to it to see results personally or hourly? An example, to be in a writer in a publication, right? Whether it's a blog or, you, or, or a place where you publish with deadlines and attention to detail required of any true published outlet. So maybe you start with a blog to prepare you for the deadlines. Maybe you have a journal 
that has a requirement, right? In my journal writing, I always require at least 20 to 25 pages a week, right? Usually I start out the year with 25 a week. And as I get closer to my goal, I loosen it to 20. And when I make my thousand uh, page goal, it frees up time at the end of the year to work on these other projects, right? And then it begins again the next year, right? Ex that's an example. Sacrifice. What was my, What must be given up, lost, and let go to fulfill the plan? Something must always be. Find it, judge its worth. Often the morality of a plan is learned here, okay? How bad do you want it? And what, do you, what are you willing to give up for it? You know what I mean? Improve immediately. The plan must have immediate payoff. There must be a legitimate activity from research, learning, working, or training. Without such, the plan stays an idea and knowledge is reduced to information of possibilities. When you work a plan, especially in the beginning, try to have some something that shows output that keeps you going with that plan. You know what I mean? If not, then you're not going to see the benefit of it. You know what I mean? You have to see some results that develop as you go along or else it'll be harder. And that's a way to make it easier, right? And then now the third thing is as you go along, adaptation. And these are, a lot of it is in the other implementation, but here are some specific points. Originality check in the adaptation. As creators, there's no plan worthwhile if we merely race to be first disingenuously or if we, or if we facade our works to meet the label of original. The plan of our works and the development of ourselves must be a unique act. Fraudulence within and the force to and the force to further it in refusal of adaptation that may include major replanning is a devilishment that will be that will be fulfilled by you if you don't take note of that. Okay. We're all creators, but as we create something really profound for us, though, we might be reinventing the wheel. Okay. And I make this note of integrity. This is this is one of the major adaptations. And then the opportunity. Identifying and judging worth to all with new opportunities. Identifying new ones to blend in that make one's work or self greater. Searching for opportunity when expected and planned pathways are extant or obscured. Also, the possibility of new goals is part of adaptation with opportunity, right? Something that you pre-plan might be in that pre-planned stage and just left there. I can't do that now. But what if it opens up? Are, are you able to integrate it in there? And are you able to push some things aside? Okay. Are you able to prioritize? This happens a lot. Okay. I get opportunities and I have to switch off. Right. Okay. And then the, the fourth thing is fulfillment. Right. It's born. Right. Because I always say born is elevated fulfillment. So this is fulfillment. Those plans that contain infinite and, and finite activities. What part of this life in the plan will be continued? In other words, what are the things in this plan that fulfilled this goal that you develop that you will continue to do, right? What has been done that will not be done yet must be learned from? How has one's culture developed from it? These are things that once you fulfill something, it's good The retrospection is key, right? And then the, la the last part of this fulfillment and the last part of this whole plus lesson is the proper humility and assessment for those plans that are clearly fulfilled, finite, the ones that are done. The judgment of self with, with arrogance and new plans will leave out much of the necessary work. But if you judge too humbly and future plans will be done with excessive requisites, too many things because you don't really, you know, you haven't judged it properly and breed a never fulfilling plan of fear and complacency. So the humility in your assessment is key, right? Not to, you can't overdo it and you can't underdo it. Right? So you have to work on how you assess how well you've done things. Okay, This is important, Okay, especially in the world of creating, which is what I'm trying to get everyone into. You know, All right, so that is the plus lesson. It is, um, it seems short, right? But it's filled with things. It's filled with things. You know what I mean? Okay. Does anybody have any questions about that? I know it's, it's, it's a heavy piece. You know, I, I, I want everybody to begin their 2022. Um,
So I, I want you to, you know, um, really go into this and not just trying to like be in a race where you feel like you're just trying to get what you started done. You know what I mean? I'm just taking a break because I was uh, I was talking a lot, so I'm just waiting for everybody to have a question or something. All right. That's peace. I will be reading over it again. See how I can use each part throughout the year because each part is pretty detailed. It is. It is. And there's more. That's why it was hard to detail it without really studying it heavily. Um, and I just didn't have the time. I, I thought it was um, well-rounded enough for that, for, for, for the moment. Moochie, I understand. I, I may have went too quick. Um, and that's because it's recorded. So you can always go back and ask questions um, of the details and everything like that. What I will do is go, I'll go through it in a more simple way right now. Okay. It's really four parts. Your decision, your implementation, right? Your adaptation and your fulfillment. Okay. Right. And um, 
if you email me and I and I give you the plus lesson, you can watch the, watch it again and see the add-ons that I give to it, and it'll become clear, right? But it's really about assessing. All of it is about having a window to everything that you're doing. So your decision is based on what you need, your wants or needs. Your implementation is based on how, what you are willing to do. You know what I'm saying? And how well you you set up each goal. Each li- each major goal is is built by small goals, right? Specific things that you'll do, right? When you'll do them. Schedules. I will do this. I will do that. Right? Gauging your own energy levels. What you can do for energy. You see how they all go back to that build awareness square, right? Because these are the things that affect your performance, right? What do you do in performance? Is it something that you'll have to perfect and and develop, right? So all of these things are in the implementation, right? And the implementation is the longest part because it has pre-planning, but it also has the specific sacrifices start to be seen, right? And you also start to see the work that has to be done just to get to the goal, right? Right? I teach the martial arts, but that means that part of my goal also has to be to constantly be training alone with the martial arts, right? As best as I can in developing. So there's a level of sacrifice with that, okay? Adaptation is more of a highlight of the second part, implementation, right? Where you're kind of looking at your your plan and it's working from a distance and saying, wait a minute, is this really original? Is this gonna be, is this gonna result in something worthwhile? Like if you're making something, if you're creating something, right? Um, Am I getting real benefit out? Should I be this good or this bad or not so great at this if my goal was to get better, right? That's where the adaptation comes from, your report cards, right? And then also the interruption of your plans by new opportunities, okay, right? Or obstacles. Sometimes opportunities are like an obstacle, okay? So that's where the adaptation comes from. And then the fulfillment. Because I want you to see that when you reach the end of your plan, what has really happened? I want you to have that looking back too. What has really happened? What are the things that you'll do that you continue to do? Have you developed a way of building? This is important because if your goal was to be a songwriter and you wrote these songs, what are the things that what are the ways, what are the things that you did to create those songs efficiently, creatively, right? And can they be repeated, right? For new songs and not just the same type of song, if that's the goal, right? And it usually is, right? So that's what I mean, you know, and the plan is, uh, again, this is a plus lesson that is best taught in the classroom because you can hold it in front of you. Uh, students who are in the class, are, are, you know, um, I could give it to you in front of you, okay? Right? Okay? And I'll tell you this, right? Um, And I I keep it real moochie, right? When we take, when you take a real, when you take college courses of significance, higher levels of teaching, you're not going to get the chance to have people slow down. There's too much information, too many things to, to learn, that you're going to have to learn how to take notes quick and get the ideas, you know? And we have the advantage here that we can go back and after this is done, you can go back and, and, and look at it. You know what I mean? Now, Quatis, you said, how do I develop the theme for each year? It was really just a pylon thing, just thinking like, well, what's left here? What's left there? And that's how I was doing it when I did it. I don't do it anymore because some of it had to do with the way my students were learning. And have different students. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think I could do that now because I don't have students regularly in front of me. So it becomes very difficult. You know what I mean? It's it's um it's not easy to do. So right. 
<clears throat> how to decide what I focus on. Yeah, that's where that comes from. You know what I mean? Because most of the things I teach, I'm thinking back to what students seem to need and what I think best that they have shown they need by either them asking or judging their work and their answers, what I find to be missing. You know, it, it, again, it's to the best of my ability. If it works most of the time now is because I have a lot of experience uh, with, with teaching. All right. All right. Again, um, I didn't put the email in there. If you email me, I'll email you the um, the plus lesson. I mean, if you literally email me right now, I will. I could send it to you right now. You know what I mean? If you don't have it, you know. And you can go through this again and, and really follow and stuff because it's really a plus lesson, not to tell you what to do, but to show you all of the facets and how this can be very layered. And so it's going to come with all of your notes and, and really become a way. I don't want to give you a way to make a plan, like list this, write that, do this. No, I want you to make that plan too. I want you to be self-sufficient, okay? These plus lessons aren't to show you how to be God. They show you how to be self-sufficient and just be aware of all that comes with it, Okay. Peace, Rakim. All right, if anybody has any questions, like we're, I'm up to less than half hour left. This is the last class of the year. I, I would like, if anybody, you know, would like any questions, to, to offer any questions, um, I'm going to, I'm going to telling you, Self I Build sent me a great list of questions, um, but I like to do them all in one block, and that's for him. So that way he can get it all at once. You know what I'm saying? Um, because they're his questions. I won't be able to answer them all tonight, though. So, I, you know, I really want to.
All right, so you let me know, okay? Okay, nobody has any questions. They've stumped them all. I have overloaded you all with the plus lesson, right? Okay. All right, complete got a lot. I'm sending you that now, okay? All right. Some of the things, you know, since I don't see any questions, some of the things that I like to do, right? I think that three things that must be done. Not even three things. Maybe that. You know, as far as our development, I think that the three major things that I add that is beyond, first off, we have to immediately gauge our diet. How will we eat? You know what I mean? And, you know, we usually eat more during the holidays. It doesn't matter if you bear witness to the holidays or nothing like that. You're, you're with family and they're enjoying the holidays and they're going to make things that taste great, whatever, right? You'll eat more, right? Celebrate more, whatever it is. Right, relax more. You have time off. Either way, right? Right, just having more time to relax will cause might cause you to eat worse. How are we going to eat? What is going to be our regimen to eating? You know, because I think that, you know, unless unless we think we're some kind of professional athlete, we shouldn't be planning our eating and stuff, and that's a falsity. But the three things that I've always engaged with is reading, writing, and training. Okay. There should be books that you decide are worthy of reading every single year at least once. All right? And as you develop those, right, you engage in them. Start by reading them. Um, if your reading is slow, start by having a combination of books that you need to read that have information, but also books that you read very fast. So you get a flow. In other words, this book might be a little bit more frivolous then read the books that are engaging to you that will speed up your reading process, right? Always important. You know what I mean? Always important, right? Also make a, make a determination of how many books you intend to read. And if you've never done that before, you'd be very disappointed as you go along through the year. And I'll just say that right now. But some of these plans, they need to fail. So... For the year that you start out these plans, do not adjust the goal. Adjust the plan, even if you fail. All right? Even if you change the goal, it's not 20 books. I just put it at 15, right? Make note of that. And what are the reasons why it wasn't like that, right? What you know, It'll make you more aware of the other things you do that take up the time or the lack of energy levels that you actually have to read. Maybe you really don't have the energy to stay awake and read, right? Or when you're doing it, you get sleepy, whatever it is, right? Because these things are all real. Another aspect, right? 
in your reading, what type of books do you need to learn from? Right? So you'd be deciding there as well. Okay? This is important as well. So, so some of the fun of making deliberate reading lists is instead of saying, I'm going to read 20 books, actually try to look up the books you have. If you have a library, look at the books you have. Look at the books you want to go get. And mind you, if there are books that you want, you ask me for it because I, I usually have it. Um, and then say, I'm going to read these books. And if you pick out the books in advance, like if it's about 20 something books, pick it out in advance. You know what I'm saying? And, and that'll be make it more enjoyable because they're actually things you want to do. The other thing is this, then we get to writing. And if you want to develop your writing skills, it's not going to be by having a blog. Because you're just going to bullshit. And just like social media, a lot of people develop a false voice. It's not really their voice. It doesn't have any of their understanding. It just has them ranting and raving the way they do. It's not developed. You know what I mean? So <clears throat> when you develop your writing skills, I think the best thing to do is have a journal first. Okay. Write down your builds. Use your journal to write down your builds and look at them over time. And then try to write down important aspects of your life. You know, how you felt, what you were doing, almost as if you were a documentarian, so you could see the understanding. If you're going to be paranoid about, like, people are going to read this, the government could get it, though, then you're being silly. Because if the government's going to read something, they're going to read, they're going to read the 60 plus journals that I've written first before they read yours right and even then though they're not going to get much that they couldn't get in real life right have a journal develop your voice hold your understanding to use in the classroom or in your journal develop it before you spout it out that's one of the misnomers of social media it has people spout out a lot of understanding that is very rudimentary and basic and that bores the shit out of me. I do not want to hear knowledge just to look, listen, and observe. I don't want to hear that shit. I don't want to hear that. Okay? That that's actually not what knowledge is. And it's it's what you it's it's how you're supposed to be dealing with the teacher that's teaching you is to look, listen, and observe. That's not what knowledge is, okay? Wisdom is the wise word spoken, is using the word in the definition, okay? I don't want to hear basic shit. Use your journal to develop your own thoughts, your own ideas. All right? Okay? And then if you really feel like you're a writer of worth, then I have the forms for you that you can practice in, that you can have your stuff published. If they're builds, if they're works of art, whatever it is. Okay? Um... And I say develop because I cannot offer a monetary compensation, but I can offer you the forms to share your work. Okay. The other thing, okay, the other thing is training. Okay. If you're the true and living God and you're not training your body, then it's mind of God and body of mush. Okay. I don't care what you think you are. If you're not training... If you go a whole week without doing a set of push-ups to failure, I mean, I, you should feel embarrassed. You should feel off point, And you need to get on point. There are no men that just happen not to work out. Not in this cipher of students that I'm building with. If you're a student of mine and you're not actively going out there to work out and train, and eventually lead up to learn some type of fighting art to defend yourself. Or at least put yourself in a physique so powerful that you get yourself healthy and cannot be to defend yourself against viruses and germs and all this COVID stuff. You're failing something critical. Critical. There is no go-between. Okay, there is no... I don't bear witness to... 
there's overweight gods, there's uh, lazy gods, skinny fat gods. No, no, no. None of that shit. You get your ass in tow. You get your ass on point. And if you're my student and you're out of shape, get your game in gear. Get your game in gear because you're failing that. Okay? And I, and I love all the brothers I teach. Okay? But in your mind, you always have to be saying, listen, do I have ailments? Do I have things stopping me? What do I do? What do I do to start thinking about this? You know what I mean? So your mind, even if you're not training, you're always in the in its in the gauge of unless I have some personal injury that I'm overcoming and stuff, I'm thinking of some type of training to do. Okay. And that's what's gonna make the way that you eat even more worthwhile. Right? It's gonna give you more confidence. It's also gonna spark the mind easier. If all of this body works though. The generation of thoughts, the generating of thoughts is going to be, um, it's not going to be impeded by a weak physical. Okay. Right. Rome, you said your food is your medicine, your medicine, your food. Be of Italy, food, food grown from the earth. Right. You also said, well, what do I feel about Zodiac with your physical being, wisdom, knowledge? Are you considered a saggy or, or Capricorn? Uh, I'm a Sagittarius. Um, other than that, though, I don't really think about it too much. Um, even when people build about astrological signs and all this kind of stuff, it really is about the idea that we're all, everything is really tied to how we think about things. And even these astrological signs are things to just point it out. I don't think we're a slave to uh, any other reality. Um you know what I mean? I, I don't. I, I, I haven't seen the proof. I, I think most of it is, you know. There's only one healthy bread I consider, and that's Ezekiel bread. Okay. It's the only bread I deal with. Okay. Powerless uh, sprouted sprouted bread, sprouted grain bread. That's that's what I do. Food for life's Ezekiel bread, and I, and when I have the chance, I, I explore their products, other products as well. So, but the um, the Ezekiel four nine bread is really what I eat. You know, that's what I eat. And also their Genesis 129, like all of their all of their sprouted um, whole grain breads, you know, all of their sprouted flourless whole grain breads. Okay, you go to Trader Joe's, you get it for a great price. So the they always have the the orange one, the orange, the sesame green, and and um, the purple cinnamon raisin. So those are great to start with. Um, there's a process I had, I had, I had studied how they do it, but I, I don't, you know, I don't bake or anything like that. So I, I didn't really remember how it was and cause I wasn't going to try it. You know what I mean? That's something I don't have time or the abilities to try. All right, we're in the last 10 minutes here. If anybody has any questions, you know, like, you know, um, how we're going to start this year, everything like that, you let me know. Also, too, if you are interested, this is a free course. If you email me about anything, I'm going to tell you everything I know about it, okay? But for those that want to learn the martial arts, if you're in the New York area, there's two things in the New York area. If you're learning this knowledge and you're in the New York area, get your ass to a law school in Mecca. Okay, I'll be, be there this Thursday, upcoming Thursday, start the year, and I'll be being there regularly, right? Um, 
And if you're in New York City, you should be you should be there. Okay, that's the best way to learn. Okay. Um, your first clue, by the way, about what's a good bread is if it's refrigerated. That's your first clue. Okay. Um, but um, I also am training in the martial arts, like my own concentrated supremacy program. Um, it's an introduction to the martial arts, especially for those that are learning through Zoom, you know. Um, it has been much more successful in Zoom than I thought it would be. And, and as good as I hoped it to be for those that I'm training in person, okay? So if you're in the New York area, I train in Staten Island, all, um, just like I did. I took, that, I took a long trek to learn as well, this knowledge itself and this martial arts. So um, it'd certainly be worth your while. My rates are, are, uh, are very good. So if you're into that, email me. That's something we'll be doing. If you're like, well, it's too cold. I don't want to train with Sunnis outside and everything like that. Again, it's only for the soldiers. You know what I mean? You, if you learn to train and work out in the winter outside, I don't think you, you may not realize how strong you'll be once that spring comes and that summer. I mean, you'd be lethal. You know what I mean? How do you stop eating bread altogether? That's simple. You know what I'm saying? First off, I don't think there's a need to if you're eating sprouted grains. Okay? But you may not want wheat. Okay? So then the sprouted grains, because it's mainly sprouted wheat grains and other grains. But if you're not eating bread, then... What do you do? You 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 focus on the legumes and the nuts and the seeds, right? Which are a huge part of my diet. A huge part of my diet is nuts and seeds. Okay, lots of sunflower seeds, um, lots of of almonds, cashews, hazelnuts, Brazil nuts, a lot, a lot. You know what I mean? And of course your legumes, your salads. Right? And there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Your grains like quinoa, right? Simpler grains like brown rice, but you could get black rices, red rices, wild rice, right? Wild black rice, right? So there's a lot of things you could do to just leave the bread alone, you know? Right? If that's what you want to do, right? But there is a big difference between a flourless bread and a floured bread. So really your question is, how can I get off flour, right? Which is an excellent thing to do. That's peace, Rome. If I ever get to the point where I need a gym and, and I have a, a bigger array of students, you know? But um, right now I, I enjoy teaching them out in... in in nature, you know,
Well, I don't know what to say about that, Muchi. You know, I don't know how he might have been over masticating. May not be the problem with the nut, with with the food. It might have been the way you chew, right? All right, so we only have a few minutes left. So the planning is crucial. Everything is crucial. I, as you see in the description notes, I will be at the school regularly in 2022 from 5 p.m. to 8 Eastern Standard Time. All right, and I will continue to stream the classes online. All right, and I am still continuing to work. Uh, expect assignments from those and. Uh, those students that are online now to really reach out to me, you know what I'm saying? Really reach out to me and help to develop how this knowledge will be more important. That's why I want all of you to write an essay about what it means to learn online. I want you to bring the value to it. You are the ones that can bring real value to this. You know, it cannot equate perfectly to, you know, to learning. Um, it cannot equate perfectly to learning in person, but you can make it where it has its honor and validity by how hard you work. You know what I mean? Okay. All right. And uh, by the way, the type of training I give, let's say if you were out far away, right, and you only could make, if you could make it to train with me once a month, I would I would give you stuff that would take a long time to develop and enough to develop. You know what I mean? Um, but again, it's your choice. This is like, if you read through, I, I could give you all the information and stuff, read through it. So you get an idea of what I'm teaching and stuff like that, you know, but, um, and the rates are, 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 are very good to say the least. You know what I mean? That's why Rome, I wouldn't travel to Jersey. I make students travel to me because my rates are very good. Okay. So it's, it's, um, it's worthwhile and deserve it that people come to me. All right. Um, all right. So with that said, um, you know, the end of the year, it's been hectic for me to get to a lot of school in Mecca with a lot of changes, this COVID stuff and the mandates and actually been more difficult than 2020, you know, it's, but, um, We continue to build, you know, and um, just because I, I try to find validity and demand that that you all press for a validity of how you're learning here online doesn't mean that um, I don't consider it the future. And that, you know, I would hope that what I've shared has been useful to everyone this year, you know. Um, so that's pretty much it. You know, the goals don't change. They just get more intense and we move more intense, you know? So with that said, I want to say, I want to thank everybody. Um, I don't know, Muchi. I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. If, I don't think so. I don't think so. But um, yeah, I want to thank everybody, you know, that that's ever supported me in any kind of way. You know what I mean? Um, if you're listening here and, and you learned something, then that's a way of supporting me as well, okay? That my time here wasn't in vain. All right, so with that said, I will see you all next year. Enjoy the new year. It's mathematics changing now. We engage in this mathematics. So, you know, all that stuff where, oh, the year really starts with spring and things like that, you know what I mean? But um, you're, you're also not living your life like a, like a plant, okay, and, and vegetation. So let's keep it real. You know, we're building based on this calendar and a lot of the reality that we live is based on this calendar. So this is just as real as the real beginning of that loop. You know what I mean? Right? There is no beginning. There is no ending except for what you make it. Right. So as we plan, though, this really is a start because the patterns start that we're using. So it's, uh, you know, right. If you're learning the martial arts and you don't like to work out in the cold, then you better be lucky that people won't want to fight you when it's cold. You could say, hey, it's too cold to fight. And they go, okay, sounds good, right? If that's possible, if you're really able to do that all the time and can guarantee it, then you don't have to get used to the cold, <laughs> right, Becky? But um, this is why I train people outside, though, you know what I mean? Only whether I don't train outside is if it's slick, you know what I mean? 
Um, other than that, though, um, yeah, we do we do it, you know. And I know you can do it though. So anything you need, right? Um, let me know. All right. And with that said, I want to say peace. I want to thank everybody. All right. And um, it's been an honor this year. Absolutely. Peace.